Hi everyone, my name is John Nickel. I'm at the University of Rochester. Today I'd like to tell you about conditional teleportation of quantum dot spin states. Uh, before I start, let me acknowledge uh, the important people and organizations here. So almost everyone in my group here has contributed in some way to this work. I'd like especially to highlight Yadav uh, uh, Kendel and Haifeng Chao. Uh, these students have done most of the work you'll see about today. Uh, we also collaborate quite a bit with Andrew Jordan and his group at the University of Rochester. And the semiconductor wafer we use was grown by Mike Manfra and his group at Purdue. And I'd like to thank DARPA, uh, the Army Research Office, and the NSF for, for funding this work. So I'll tell you about quantum teleportation in quantum dot spin qubits today. Uh, the basic idea of a quantum dot spin qubit is to encode a qubit state into the spin degree of freedom of an electron. In some sense, this is the simplest possible qubit. An electron spin state can point either up or down. Those are the two spin states. Uh, one typically achieves this in practice by using something called a gate-defined quantum dot. So the idea is to start with some kind of a layered semiconductor header structure, in this case, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide. At the interface between these two layers, there is a sheet of free electrons. This is called a two-dimensional electron gas, or two deg. Uh, and then by using lithographically patterned metal wires or gates on the surface of the semiconductor, and then by applying voltages on these gates, uh, for example, using negative voltages to these, applied to these gates, you can selectively deplete parts of the two-dimensional electron gas and confine uh, a discrete number of electrons in a small place. This is a, a quantum dot. Um, some of the nice things about quantum dot spin qubits, especially when one thinks about other types of qubits, are that they have extremely long coherence time. So the phase coherence time of individual electron spins in isotopically pure silicon can exceed one second. You should imagine comparing this to the typical tens of gigahertz precession rates for individual spins. They're also scalable in the sense that they're rather small. Typical sizes are 50 to 100 nanometers for each qubit, and they're based in semiconductors. And one can imagine taking advantage of uh, global expertise in semiconductor fabrication uh, to scale up these devices. So quantum dots have been around for, for actually quite some time, more than 30 years now. In fact, uh, the first quantum dots were produced and studied before it was easy to create a scanning electron microscope image of this device and, and put it in your paper. Uh, since before 1990, there's been a lot of progress over the years, a lot of technological development. And modern devices now look quite a bit different than uh, these, these, these older devices. You see that it's now possible to fabricate uh, uh, many quantum dot spin qubits in tightly controlled geometries, uh, and this is very useful for, uh, uh, for quantum computing applications. So in particular, when, when one thinks about quantum computing, you know, one needs to ask how well do the individual qubits perform. Uh, by now, quantum dot spin qubits satisfy all of the, the DiVincenzo criteria. So these are a list of criteria David DiVincenzo wrote down now more than 20 years ago that any qubit platform should, should realize. In particular, one needs well-defined qubits. It's hard to imagine a better defined qubit than a spin one half. It's uh, easily possible to initialize spin qubits with very high fidelity in particular quantum states. Uh, single and two qubit gates for spin qubits now have fidelities above 99% for single qubit gates and 98% for two qubit gates. They have very long coherence times, as I said before, and it's very easy to measure these using a variety of spin to charge conversion mechanisms with very high fidelity. Uh, as you see from the last slide, now it's possible to create many spin qubits, precisely. Um, one other thing that is, is important and that the community has realized in the past several years is the notion of high connectivity. One would ideally like uh, any individual qubit in a processor to be connected with many others. This enables one to perform more efficient algorithms than you'd be able to otherwise, and it also lets uh, you, you perform quantum error correction protocols. Um, as Yad mentioned in the last talk, and as, as you might imagine by looking at these linear chains of spin qubits, achieving this high connectivity can pose a challenge. Again, the main reason is that individual electrons most naturally interact with their, their nearest neighbors only. Uh, so achieving high connectivity is a very intense and active area of research in the field. Uh, one can imagine using superconducting microwave resonators. Uh, you could imagine using 
super exchange. This is a type of long distance exchange coupling. You could imagine physically moving the electrons uh, using electric fields or uh, by having the electrons literally surf on, on top of surface acoustic waves. Um, of course, the, the initial motivation uh, and concept behind using electron spins as qubits involved using this nearest neighbor exchange coupling that Yad mentioned before uh, to perform multi-qubit operations. And the, the advantage of this is that it's, it sort of very naturally comes about. It's, it's an essential feature of, of electron spin systems, as I'll say a little bit later. Uh, of course, again, the downside is that exchange coupling typically only couples nearest neighbor qubits. So in this talk, I'll tell you about how, maybe surprisingly, you can use this nearest neighbor exchange coupling to perform long distance teleportation of, of quantum dot spin states. And perhaps the take home message is that, in fact, there's really a wide variety of exciting possibilities enabled by this nearest neighbor exchange coupling for, for long distance inf information transfer in, uh, in spin chains. So next I'll give you a quick introduction to quantum teleportation. I'll tell you about the essential sort of aspects of the physics of two electron spins uh, in, in a quantum dot, which would be useful for quantum teleportation. Then you tell, I'll tell you about our experimental results and finish with, uh, finish with an outlook. So in case it's been a while since you thought about quantum teleportation, let me remind you how this goes. So the central question is, how can I teleport an unknown quantum state phi from Alice to Bob? Now, the way that teleportation proceeds is uh, that you create a quantum resource, an entangled pair, an EPR pair, einstein podolsky rosen pair, uh, and you distribute one member of the entangled pair to Alice and uh, the other to Bob. Now, in order to teleport this state phi from Alice to Bob, Alice should measure uh, her member of the EPR pair together with phi jointly in, uh, in the Bell state basis. This then projects Bob's qubit up to phi up to single qubit rotations. Uh, in order for Bob to apply the correct single qubit rotation, Alice needs to tell Bob uh, the result of her measurement as, as classical information. All right, so some important points. This state phi can be any, any state. Uh, we do not need to know what phi is beforehand, so we say that teleportation works with unknown quantum states. It happens instantly in the sense that when Alice measures her qubit together with phi, that instantly projects Bob's qubit on, onto phi. Uh, Alice does not need to know where Bob is. Uh, right? this, this projection of Bob's qubit onto phi doesn't care where, where Bob is. Moreover, even though Alice needs to send her inf her, the result of her measurement to Bob, she could broadcast this as classical information. Bob can pick it up wherever he is. Um, you know, one thing that's important is that this procedure requires making, distributing, and measuring entangled pairs uh, of, of qubits. Uh, it's useful, obviously, for things like communication. Uh, it turns out there's a whole class of error correction protocols based on quantum teleportation. There are also various clever ways to perform quantum computing based, based on teleportation. All right. So, Teleportation has been demonstrated in a number of physical quantum computing platforms by now. It's, it's really a milestone. So this was first demonstrated in uh, optical photons, followed later by demonstrations in trapped ions, uh, superconducting qubits, and, uh, and, and NV centers. Uh, you see, of course, that, that quantum dots are not among this list yet. So now I want to tell you about uh, what we've done to realize conditional teleportation. So let me, let me start by um, emphasizing some of the important physics features of this system of electron spin qubits. Uh, hopefully you can see how these are useful for, for teleportation. So the first is the notion of Pauli spin blockade. So let's suppose we have two electrons in one quantum dot. There are four possible spin states of the two electrons. Here they are. It's convenient to write them in the singlet triplet basis. These are eigenfunctions of the exchange operator. Um, suppose I have the two electrons in a spin singlet state. Um, this is an antisymmetric spin state. The orbital wave function of these two electrons, therefore, must be 
symmetric, such that the total wave function is anti-symmetric. Uh, this means that both electrons can occupy, if they have the spin singlet configuration, the ground state orbital of the same quantum dot. Okay, this is not true for the triplet states. Uh, because these have a symmetric spin configuration, they need to have an anti-symmetric orbital configuration, which means that one electron has to, has to occupy an excited orbital state in the quantum dot. Um, this means, for example, if you have two electrons in separate dots, if you try to tilt them together into the same dot, they won't go into the same dot if they have the triplet state, uh, but they will if they have the singlet state. So you see there's a subtle connection between spin and, and charge in a system of two electrons in a double dot. You can use this to read out entangled states of electrons by, by trying to put two electrons into the same dot. If they have this spin singlet configuration, that can happen. It can't if they're triplet. Uh, you can, in a sense, reverse this process to initialize entangled states of electrons. If you, for example, wait long enough when the ground state of the system has two electrons in the same dot, this will generate an entangled singlet state. Uh, this is called polyspin blockade. One way to think about polyspin blockade is through this phenomenological Hamiltonian here. This is the exchange Hamiltonian. Uh, it takes just a few lines of algebra to see why this Hamiltonian creates a lower energy for the singlet state than the triplet state. So here these are two operators representing the two, the two spins. Um, let me just dive a, a little bit more into uh, this exchange Hamiltonian here. So if I expand this exchange Hamiltonian in terms of the poly matrices, here's, here's this dot product of the two operators expanded. Uh, this is something that's easy to, to compute. Uh, if I do this and then compute this uh, exponential of this Hamiltonian given this particular time, you see that the propagator for a two electron system evolving under exchange for this particular time looks like this. So I've written it in, in this basis here. So you see if I start with up, up, nothing happens. If I start with down, down, also nothing happens. But if I start with up, down, the state goes to down, up, and vice versa. If I start with down, up, the state goes to up, down. So you see that evolving two electrons under exchange swaps their states. Um, this is what Yad told us nicely about in, in the last talk. Uh, the last thing I, I want to tell you about has to do with singlet triplet oscillations in a magnetic gradient. Yad talked about this also in the last talk. The idea is if I create an entangled singlet pair of electrons, if I uh, have the two electrons occupy different locations, if there's a different magnetic field at these two locations, essentially one spin will acquire a phase factor at a different rate depend, uh, uh, than the other one. This will coherently evolve the singlet to the unpolarized triplet and back at a rate that, that depends on this magnetic field difference. So typically what we see in the lab when we do this kind of experiment are these oscillations in the vertical direction here. Uh, the repetition on the x-axis is something like lab time. You see that this oscillation frequency changes in time. This is because this magnetic gradient results from nuclear spins in the problem. These are randomly fluctuating nuclear spins. This generates a randomly fluctuating magnetic gradient. So if you forget everything else from this talk, you should probably remember this slide, the essential features of electrons in, in quantum dots for the purposes of teleportation are that poly spin blockade enables electrical initialization and readout of entangled spin states. Remember that this is important for teleportation. Exchange coupling leads to a swap between neighboring spins. This is important for distributing this EPR pair that we eventually need to do. Magnetic gradient generates coherent singlet triplet oscillations. Uh, we'll use this to kind of endow entangled pairs with a particular fingerprint that we can track uh, throughout, throughout this experiment. Uh, so I'll tell you about teleportation in a four dot device. Uh, I can tell you more about this later. Here are the four dots, the four qubits themselves, one, two, three, four. Uh, at various points during this talk, I'll refer to the left pair of qubits and, uh, and also the right pair of qubits. Uh, so as a first step toward teleportation, let me convince you that we can control the exchange coupling between all nearest neighbor pairs of spins. Remember that this is essential for swapping states and distributing states throughout this array. So these are exchange oscillations between spins one and two. Uh, if you take the line cut here, 
you see that as time varies, the spins are literally swapping back and forth. Uh, uh, and this is something we can measure. Here are exchange oscillations between spins three and four. And in this panel are exchange oscillations between spins two and three. All right, so this is kind of a prerequisite for uh, moving quantum states anywhere we'd like throughout this array. Uh, as Yad mentioned in, in his last talk, um, using concatenated swap pulses lets us certainly transfer classical states uh, throughout, throughout this array. Uh, it also lets us transfer entangled states. Uh, let me just emphasize that point because it's crucial for this. Um, so you had mentioned this before, but suppose we, we create an entangled singlet in dots three and four. Remember, we can do this trivially using this notion of poly spin blockade. Let's suppose that we perform a swap between spins two and three so that the entangled pair lives in dots two and four. If we wait some period of time, we would expect to see coherent singlet triplet uh, rotations, and we can reverse this swap to measure it. So that's indeed what we see. These are coherent singlet triplet rotations here. Uh, you could object and say, well, how do I know that your experiment is actually working? After all, if this swap operation did, did nothing, you might still expect to see singlet triplet rotations. That's what we see over here, but you see that the frequency is different in these two cases. So this lets us know that the entangled state is, is occupying different physical locations. Okay, so after all that, let me now tell you about uh, teleportation. We've assembled all of the ingredients. So let's first imagine that we create a singlet state between spins three and four. This is an EPR pair. We'll separate the two via tunneling. After a swap between spins two and three, the EPR pair occupies dots two and four. Now let me do a poly spin blockade measurement between qubits one and two. Remember that will project these two qubits onto the singlet triplet basis. This is, in some sense, a Bell state measurement. Here I'm imagining that qubit one is the state to be teleported phi. If we measure these two together as a singlet state, we have measured a Bell state. In this case, we expect phi to be teleported from here to Bob's qubit. So this is a conditional teleportation procedure because it works only when we measure uh, a, a singlet here. Here's the circuit diagram uh, for this process. Here's the entangled pair we create between qubits three and four. Here's the swap operation. This conditional measurement um, tells us that when we measure these two as a singlet, when we project them onto that Bell state, phi will be teleported from qubit one uh, to, to qubit four, okay? Uh, again, I wanna point out that this procedure makes use of some of the nice features of, of electron spins and quantum dots. Uh, so as a start to convince you that this works, let's imagine preparing qubit one as a uh, spin up. If qubit two is, is also spin up at the beginning, um, after this swap, the state of qubit two goes to qubit three, and if the teleportation was successful, qubit one will go to qubit four. All right, so if everything worked as planned, qubits three and four should both have uh, spin up. If we induce an exchange gate between them at the end of the teleport operation, nothing should happen. Indeed, that's what we see. This flat line here shows no oscillations. Uh, if we get something other than a singlet here, we know that there was some probability for the teleport not to work. There's some probability for spin four to be down. Now you see weak exchange oscillations appear in the data. Um, so the difference between these two curves is these are measurements on the right pair conditioned on getting either a singlet or a triplet on, on the left pair. Again, you could object saying, well, this is teleportation of, of a classical state. Uh, moreover, it's a known classical state. You might as well just put the spin up in a suitcase and take it from Alice to Bob. Uh, so let me show you that this process is coherent. Let me also show you that this works for entangled states. So uh, let me now tell you about an experiment uh, that demonstrates entanglement swapping in the system. Let me imagine creating the EPR pair between qubits one and two here. Let's suppose that I prepared qubits three and four also as an entangled state. Remember, both of these processes are easy to do via spin blockade. Let me separate the entangled pairs like this. Then let me perform a swap between qubits two and three. Now you see the entangled pairs occupy dots one and three and qubits two and four. 
Now, if I measure qubits 3 and 4 together, what happens? Well, here I'm thinking of qubit 4 as the state to teleport phi. The purple qubits are the EPR pair. So upon measuring a singlet here, the state phi should be teleported to qubit 1 to Bob. After that happens, you see that the green entangled pair is over here. Uh, it started over here. Moreover, immediately before this measurement, qubits 1 and 2 were completely uncorrelated. They, they, they belong to entirely different EPR pairs. So this measurement swaps the entanglement between 1 and 3 and 2 and 4 to 3 and 4 and 1 and 2. These qubits were, were not entangled before the measurement, but the measurement induces uh, entanglement between them. OK, how can I prove to you that this actually works? Well, let's imagine allowing this green pair to evolve in its magnetic gradient, which you remember should generate coherent singlet triplet rotations before I perform this measurement. So if everything goes as planned, we should be able to measure coherent singlet triplet rotations on qubits 1 and 2 that occurred initially on qubits 3 and 4. And we're able to do this by this process of entanglement swapping and measurements. So here's the circuit diagram for this procedure. Uh, let me uh, skip over this and uh, show you the data. So on the left panel is the probability that I will measure a singlet over here as a function of evolution time. This is the time that I allow this pair to evolve in its magnetic gradient. And on the right panel is the probability that I'll measure these two as a singlet. Okay, so you notice that there are no features to speak of in the data. In fact, it's easy to understand why both of these uh, values, both of these average values are about 25%. I'm projecting two completely uncorrelated qubits onto the singlet triplet basis. I have 25% chance of measuring one of the Bell states. Now, if I condition these measurements on the left side on getting a singlet on the right side, this is when I expect teleportation to have occurred. Now you see prominent oscillations appear in, uh, in the data. If I condition the left side measurements on getting a triplet over here, I see the opposite, which is what I expect. In some sense, these two must add together to give me the purple line. Um, so that's, that's, that's promising, right? These are oscillations that appear only when I condition the data on one or the other measurement on, on the left side. Uh, while, we've doing these, while we've done these measurements, at the same time we've also tracked the frequencies corresponding to these magnetic gradients in time. So this data here comes from one particular repetition. Again, think of this as, as lab time. Uh, so there's some particular frequency of oscillation here. Over time, the magnetic gradients vary like this. So we've also tracked the frequency that we measure here on qubits 1 and 2. You see that it overlays almost exactly with the magnetic gradient that we've measured independently on qubits 3 and 4. So we're measuring this coherent evolution associated with the gradient between dots 3 and 4 on, on dots 1 and 2 as a, result of this, as a result of this measurement. So this is, we interpret this as evidence of entanglement swapping. You can also ask what happens if I condition the measurements of the right side on the left side measurements. I also see these oscillations appear. This, and they appear with the same frequency. This is an example of quantum gate teleportation. So uh, before we created, we imagined creating the EPR pair between qubits 1 and 2. Remember that we had qubits 3 and 4 begin as a singlet state. I can equivalently think of qubits 3 and 4 as the EPR pair. Uh, I can imagine the effect of the magnetic gradient is to apply a Z rotation to one of them. Uh, in this case, I'm teleporting qubit 1 to qubit 4. Um, the measurements I make of essentially qubit 4 at the end of this uh, appear as if this gate was applied to this qubit. So gate teleportation happens when you apply an operation to one member of an EPR pair. When you use that EPR pair to teleport a state, it is as if that gate were applied to the state you are teleporting. So this is an example, uh, a very simple example of, of teleportation. Let me just, of gate teleportation. Let me just say a word about the fidelity here. Uh, 
Um, let me say we simulate the fidelity of the entanglement swapping operation to be about 0.7. Uh, based on our data, we measure essentially a maximum entanglement swapping probability of 0.71 plus or minus 0.4. Uh, the relevant classical bound for this experiment is two-thirds. It might seem surprising that this is uh, the same classical bound you expect for, for a different type of experiment, but indeed it is. So you can see that we expect that we're, that we're beating this. Uh, and the limiting factors in this operation are the, the magnetic gradient as, as well as readout errors. All right, so let me just uh, finish with, with a brief outlook. Uh, ultimately, of course, one wants to, do, one wants to demonstrate teleportation of, of arbitrary states. Um, we've not demonstrated full teleportation of arbitrary quantum states. Uh, this will likely happen in silicon as opposed to gallium arsenide because of the reduced uh, nuclear spin noise in the system. We have very active effort in, um, in, in this area in my lab. Uh, I'm going to point out on this slide several different talks in this meeting from my group. Eventually, one would like to demonstrate unconditional teleportation of arbitrary states. This requires single and two qubit gates. Um, if one wants to do feed forward, if one wants to use the measurement result from Alice to apply the correct rotation on Bob's part, we need fast measurements. We have a very active effort in this as well. Uh, on, a, on a broader note, I think this, this work maybe uh, helps to point out some other interesting ways of information transfer. So in fact, there are other types of teleportation, including adiabatic quantum teleportation that the system is now poised to explore. You could also imagine using uh, exchange coupled spin chains to transfer information from Alice to Bob. Uh, we also have an effort uh, along this line as well. So, so with that, I'll just show this uh, summary slide and say thanks for your time and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. So is it possible to do bell basis measurements in the system? Yes, it is possible to do bell basis measurements. So you need the ability to do uh, a C naught and single qubit gates on the two qubits you're trying to measure. Both of those things have been demonstrated in the community. It's essentially by coincidence that our device doesn't feature the ability to do that. So do you want to achieve uh, teleportation of characteristics? So uh, if you have a magnetic field gradient between, uh, between the dots uh, to demonstrate teleportation of arbitrary states, you, you would like the ability to prepare arbitrary states and perform tomographic rotation pulses. Uh, if you have a magnetic gradient, you could imagine performing this using various techniques associated with electrically driven spin resonance. And these are all standard in the community, and again, it's mostly by coincidence that this, dice devi this device doesn't feature that possibility. Okay, great.